Good morning. Please pull out your Bibles or your smartphones for the scripture reading. I'll be reading in Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. I'm going to be reading out of the clear word. Remember to observe the Sabbath because I have set it apart as holy. There are six days in the week for you to earn a living, but the seventh day of the week belongs to the Lord your God. On that day, you are to do no work, you or your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals, or any aliens living among you. Because in six days, I, the Lord your God, created the earth the sky, the seas, and everything in them. And on the seventh day, I rested in the joy of having made it all. That's why I blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy, so you can rest and rejoice with me. Good morning. Before I start, I just want to say how privileged I feel to be part of this church and how overwhelmed I am at all your prayers and your support and your encouragement throughout the week and always. And as a classic example, this morning as we gathered um, to get ready, I you gave me a Bible. It's the minister's Bible. It's a really cool Bible. It's a New King James version, but it also has all kinds of cool helps and topics like baptism and weddings. So on the fly, you know, if I'm, now that I'm a new minister, I guess, um, if you ask me to do something real quick, I have some handy dandy notes. So thank you, Papa, very, very much. Um, Just one more housekeeping note. In your bulletins, you guys were given an interactive family guide. It's kind of your guide to navigating with me as we go through today's topic. So if you didn't get one of these, raise your hands and we'll make sure that you get one. Everyone should get one of these. So if you decided to share bulletins, raise your hand so that you can get a copy of this because you're going to want to work with me as we, we talk today about the Sabbath. When was the last time you received something special in the mail? Imagine with me for a moment that you received a very special letter in your mailbox. It's on rather fancy looking paper, complete with seal and insignia. And when you look at the return address, it's from the White House. Your family gathers together to see what kind of exciting mail could be on such official looking stationery. And when you open it, there's an invitation. The President and the First Lady are inviting you and your family to spend a very special day with them. A whole 24 hours at the White House. Can you imagine the excitement that you start to feel as you think, what am I going to wear? What am I going to say? What are we going to do there? What kinds of food are they going to give us to eat? A day with the President. Wow, how awesome, how amazing. Really cool, huh? We are all given something better than an invitation to spend a day with the president. It's better than a day with your favorite celebrity. We're given an invitation of a royal caliber. We are invited to spend one day, not just one day, but one day every week with the King of Kings. Every Sabbath, God invites you to spend some very special time with him. A day with the King of Kings, the creator of all, the savior of mankind. He wants to spend some time with you. And yet somehow, sometimes, we treat his very special invitation, not even with all the excitement and anticipation of a cool birthday party, but as a chore, as an obligation, and as a task. Today, my sermon is titled... Remembering the day of delight, let us pray. Hi, God. Thank you for today. Please come into our presence and use me to share your words. Amen. So, so far, 
this year, we've been looking at God's Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. And so let's take a review of the commandments that we've talked about so far. Does anyone remember number one? Number one was, thou shall have no other gods before me. Number two, does anyone remember two? Thou shall not make any graven images. Number three, we talked about last week. Pastor Taylor talked about the name. Number three was, thou shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Well, today we're going to talk about the fourth commandment. And we're going to read it together from the screen. I have it here in the New Living Translation. So let's read it together. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest, dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. So what exactly is the Sabbath? The Bible defines the Sabbath as a holy day set aside for rest from ordinary work, dedicated to the Lord. It is a day blessed by God. I like celebrations. In fact, in our family, we celebrate everything. We celebrate traditional things like birthdays and anniversaries and holidays, but we also have been known to celebrate other things like half birthdays, cookie day, national hug day. We've even celebrated backwards day where you do everything backwards from dressing backwards to eating dinner foods for breakfast and breakfast foods for dinner. Really fun stuff. Well, the ideas of the holiday started back in the beginning of the world where Sabbath was first created. God had just created the world, and now he's ready to throw a party. He's ready to celebrate it. And so what does he do? He creates the first holiday, Sabbath, a holy day. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, so the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. The Sabbath wasn't just a one-time holiday meant for Adam and Eve. God designed the Sabbath to be a weekly celebration of his creative power. So in addition to being a holy day as a sign set aside for his people, he wanted us to celebrate his creative power. We see through scripture that this day wasn't just for one set of people either. In several passages in the Bible, we see that other people kept the Sabbath. If you look on your guide, we'll see that in Luke 4, 16, Mark 1, 21, and Luke chapter 13, verse 10, we see that Jesus kept the Sabbath, that it was his custom to go to church on Sabbath. And then in Acts chapter 13, verses 13 to 14, and Acts chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, we see that the apostles kept the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, the Sabbath was not just for people who lived through Bible times either. When we look at Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 to 23, we see that those who worship in the new earth will worship on Sabbath. So let's read Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23 together. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. God must have known, though, that man would have been tempted to forget this awesome invitation because he embedded this commandment right in the middle of his Big Ten, and he starts it with the word, remember. And then in case we forget what exactly it is that we're supposed to remember, he sets the parameters by identifying what day was the Sabbath, the seventh day. And then he tells us what we should do on the Sabbath. We should keep it holy. 
We celebrate the Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday based on the creation format where we read that the evening and the morning was the day. And so based on that, we believe that the day really begins with the dark part, the night, and then into the morning. Isaiah 58 verse 13 also adds some more light on how we should remember the Sabbath day. And let's read this one together because I really like this text. It's the kind of the whole crux that we're basing our message today. It says, keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath in everything you do on that day, and don't follow your own desires or talk idly. See, God wants us to make the Sabbath a delight. So close your eyes with me just for a second. When you hear the word delight, what comes to mind? What are the images that you held? I looked up the definite, you can open your eyes now if you've had your images in mind, and hold on to those images because we'll come back to it. But I looked up the word delight in the dictionary, and this is what I found. Delight, something that makes you very happy, something that gives you great pleasure or, or satisfaction. So some of your images may have looked like these on the screen. I know for my son Andre, the bottom one represents delight for him. Delight is a water park during the summertime. I'm a foodie, so when I think of delight, I think of a yummy sundae full with all the toppings on top. But tell me, when you closed your eyes just now and you thought about delight, did the Sabbath come to mind? But seriously, God in Isaiah tells us that he wants us to make the Sabbath a delight. Not just to keep his day holy, that's good and he wants you to do that too, but he wants you to think of it as a day of delight. And this is possible, and may I add, even necessary, especially if you have children living at home with you. With some intentionality and planning and effort, you can turn your Sabbaths into a holy and delightful day. Growing up as a child, my sister and I used to like to try new recipes, and so one summer morning, we decided we were going to make unleavened bread. Um, so we pulled out the recipe for unleavened bread, and we started working on it. And well, as we started working through the recipe, we decided, ah, we think we got this. We can wing it and do our own thing. So we put aside the recipe and started continuing making our unleavened bread. And then we decided we'd add some of our own touches, our own personal twists. So we added some cocoa powder, and then some applesauce, and then some spices here, and some spices there. Before you knew it, what we had was a chocolate applesauce cake-like thingy, which, which actually tasted pretty good. It didn't turn out bad, but it wasn't unleavened bread. My point is that sometimes you need a recipe and you need to follow it to help make sure you stay on track and get to the desired end point. So sometimes a recipe can be helpful in making the Sabbath a delight. And I like to use what I call the joy recipe for Sabbath delight. And this is where we use the letters of the word joy, J-O-Y, as an acronym for the ingredients in our Sabbath delight. So as you can guess, the first and most important ingredient in our Sabbath delight is Jesus. Make Jesus first. He's the foundation. He's the best part. He's like the apple pie in your apple pie a la mode. Um, put Jesus first, and then we'll build around it. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20, we read that God says, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. This text denotes that the Sabbath is not just meant to be a sign and a day to refrain from work, but it's also supposed to be a day where we come to know God. And knowing here isn't just a superficial head knowledge. Knowing refers to actually knowing somebody and developing a relationship, an intimate relationship with that person. God desires to spend time with his people so that we can know him better. And there are three main ways that we can spend quality time with God. And those three main ways are prayer, interacting with his word, 
and reflecting on his character through nature. So at this point, you're going to help me teach the next section of our, of our, our talk this morning. Sermon sounds so official. Um, so you have colored papers in your pews. You're going to get into groups of about six-ish. You need one paper per group. And in your small groups, you are going to talk more about these three areas. Each group will pick one of the areas. I will actually assign you the area of prayer, interacting with God's word, and reflecting on his character through nature. And you're going to come up with creative ways. You can throw in some traditional ways as well that you can know God better through one of those ways. And I want you to feel free to think outside the box. Approach this as you're wanting to speak plan a very special visit with a very special person. So before you break into your groups, if you have a pink paper, the group with pink paper should write down creative ways or traditional ways that we can learn God, know God through prayer. If you have orange, your topic is interacting with God's word. And then if you have green, your topic is reflecting on God's character through nature. So pink is prayer. Orange, what are you going to do? God's word. And if you have green, what's your topic? Nature. Nature, reflecting on his character through nature. And for those of you online, we want your feedback as well. So feel free to chat in the YouTube chat box or go to our our, our Twitter site at PawPawSDA and share your comments. We'll take about two minutes to do this, and then we'll share. We probably won't get to everybody's points, but we will continue this conversation on Facebook. So at the end, I'll collect all of your thoughts, and we'll put them on the Facebook page so everybody can come up, see the wonderful ideas that you came up with. So let's get into our groups, and let's start. If any group doesn't have a paper, raise your hand and we'll be happy to get you a paper. Okay, you have about 30 seconds more to wrap up your thoughts. Okay, it seems like everybody's got their thoughts together, so hold on to those sheets. We'll come to them. So one way we can get to know God better is through talking to him in prayer. Here is where we empty our hearts to God. We tell him what's on our minds, and hopefully we pause to listen to what he wants to share to us. 
Try to vary the way that you speak and the things that you say so that it doesn't get boring. So it's okay for starters to start with your regular God bless us today kind of prayer, but eventually you want to step it up a little bit. Can you imagine what a friendship would be like if every time you met your friend, it was like, hi friend, how are you? Can you give me something? Okay, bye. And what if that were your prayer, your, 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 the essence of your conversation every time you met that friend? You wouldn't have that friend for very long, would you? So let's not do that with God. So what ideas did you come up with? Did anyone have some really cool ideas that they wanted to share on prayer? Those groups that had pink papers that had prayer ideas? Yes. He said sing a prayer. That's a really great idea. I like that. Any other prayer ideas? Okay. Well, some of the ideas that I came up with was doodling your prayers. Visualize your prayer and then draw it. You can either draw it out or you can have different symbols represent different things that your prayers mean. You can pray scriptures. A great example of praying scriptures is Psalm 5110 where we read, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. What a nice prayer to pray when we've done something wrong or we've had the wrong attitude. You can pray a theme where you pray for the hungry or pray for students or pray for missionaries. Or you could prayer walk. So you can choose a church or a neighborhood. You can choose a school or even a dream that you may have. And you walk around that item praying for it. Or you could write your prayers. You can write your prayers through journaling or poetry or singing, writing songs. Another way that we talked about getting to know God was interacting with him through his word. Um, And again, here, it's okay to start with just reading the Bible. That's a great place to start. But then you can build on that. Read a little more slowly, pausing to ask yourself, what is God trying to tell me today? When you do this, you will realize that God's word is living, it's active, it's dynamic, and very applicable to our everyday lives. And this is one significant way that God will communicate with us. So what are some of the ideas that you had? I think that was the orange papers. What are some? Yes. Oh, I like that. She said, carve a Bible verse on wood. Very great idea for interacting with God's word. Any other ideas? Yes. Bible charades and skits, acting out God's word. Great ideas. So Bible games are great. Um, you can do Bible studies and where you do specific words. You pick a word, say maybe the word love, and you study that word in the context of the Bible, or you can study a Bible book. Maybe pick the book of Habakkuk and study that book. Or you can do a topic study, maybe a topic of salvation. Um, Bible journaling is a great way to interact with God's Word because it, it helps you slow down and focus on His Word. I personally like to use the SOAP method of Bible journaling. It's the acronym S-O-A-P, where the S is where you write the scripture, and then the O is your observation, and then your A is your application, and then you end with P, your prayer. So that's one method that you can interact with God's word. Then, of course, there's memorization, which is great for small kids. And a great way to do scripture memorization is through songs, because your children will remember those verses long after they're past school age. And then lastly, we talked about reflecting on God's character through nature. That's a great way that we can learn more about God. What ideas did you have about how we can learn more about God through nature? Yes? Prayer walks. walks. That's great. And someone online mentioned um, hikes, nature hikes, and treasure hunts, and watching birds, doing nature crafts, and reading about nature. Really great ideas from our online crew. Thank you. Anyone else here had an idea as to how we can learn more about God through nature? Volunteering at an animal shelter, yes? We used to play, I think something that reminds me, out in nature, and we used to sing that remind us of I like that. I see things that remind me, and they point out things in nature that remind them of Bible stories. There was one hand here, and then we'll go here. Was there a hand back here? Uh, 
Reflecting on his character through the things that we see in nature. Very good. And one more in the back. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, being with kids outside in nature. That's a great way to enjoy the Sabbath. I have a little clip that I'm going to show you. Louis Giglio reflects on God's awesomeness and greatness by looking at the stars. And so I'm going to show you this clip. So we're looking at something so intense that we don't want to get any closer than 93 million miles away, which is what we are right now. And then we read that God just breathes out stars. It's crazy to think about it. A million times the size of the earth. So here's a little perspective that sort of changed my life. If the earth were the size of a golf ball, okay, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. Okay, that didn't seem to move anybody either, so let me try it a different way. Let me just try it just a different way. I thought I might need this, so I brought a golf ball, okay? So all through the evening, this is gonna represent Earth, all right? So this is where we are. I need everybody in the building to look as closely as you can and find yourself, okay? And when you found yourself, I want you to nod your head so that I know you've located you on the Earth, okay? You're nodding your head, okay, you found yourself. If the Earth were a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. That's not 15 feet in diameter. Can we blow that up just a hair, maybe give them 15 feet in diameter? So here's a little perspective for you, okay? Is this working for anybody? Here we are on the Earth, and that's the sun. It's so big. It's so big, you could put 960,000 Earths inside the sun. So if the Earth were a golf ball and the, and the sun were 15 feet in diameter, you could put 960,000 golf balls inside that 15 foot diameter sun. That's enough golf balls, by the way, because I know that seems like a big number, to fill a school bus with golf balls could fit inside the 15 foot in diameter sun. It's a massive star and it's one of hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, our cul-de-sac in the neighborhood called the cosmos that God has made. I love science and science has just brought us the largest star they found. It's called, are you ready for this? Canis Majoris. Now I'm no linguist, but that's a cool name for the biggest star we have found so far. I think that means the big dog star, and that's exactly what it is. I bring it to you as a little bitty purple, you know, glow just to the right of center there. But Canis Majoris, oh wow, if the earth were a golf ball, <laughs> Canis Majoris would be the height of Mount Everest. <laughs> Almost six miles above sea level, the highest point on the planet, and I just dare you to get up there and unzip the parka and pull out your golf ball. <laughs> you could fit seven quadrillion Earths inside Canis Majoris. That's enough Earths if the Earth were a golf ball to cover the entire state of Texas in golf balls 22 inches deep. What an awesome, powerful, big and mighty God we serve. A God who breathes stars out of nothingness. And this amazing God wants to spend a day with you, a day with me every week. So let's go back to our recipe. We talked about the first ingredient, which was? Jesus. And so the next ingredient we need to put into our Sabbath delight, <clears throat> excuse me, is others. God is a relational God, and building a relationship with God does not happen in a vacuum. God wants us to grow closer to him while we grow closer in our other relationships, our relationships with our family members, with fellow believers, and in service to others in his love. So we can't ignore the role of relationships as we grow in our spiritual walk. And Sabbath is a great time to do that. It helps us build these spiritual bonds and these relationships so that we can also grow with God. Chief among these relationships is our family relationships. And a recent study in the UK was done on how much time families spend together. And they found that families spend on the average a little less than eight hours total for the week together. Um, and most of these hours were spent in front of screen 
or in silence. So there was very little communication in families. And I'm sure this was in the UK, but I'm sure the numbers in the US are probably similar, maybe even a little less, because we're just all so busy and scattered. The number one reason they cited for this lack of quality time was just being tired and not having enough time. And so the Sabbath is a perfect antidote for this. It's a perfect opportunity to foster and create quality time with our families and to build spiritual value in our family lives. This time doesn't happen by accident, though. It does take some planning. And our family ministries department here at Papa does a great job of sharing ideas for families that, uh, that they can spend during the Sabbath time during the pastor's newsletter. So be sure to read those newsletter tips and incorporate some of these ideas into your Sabbath plan sometimes. The nice thing is that everything we've talked about so far, interacting with God's Word through um, Bible games or creative prayer ideas or interacting with nature, coming to church together will all build into our quality time with our families. Fellowship with other believers is also essential to our growth as well. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25, we read, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So we are instructed to meet with one another. And the purpose of this meeting is for encouraging one another. So take advantage of those potluck opportunities for greeting one another or greeting each other when we come to church together to worship. Service opportunities is another important aspect of making Sabbath a delight. And scripture teaches us that we should do good to others. In Matthew 12, verse 12, we read, So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, we read, Be kind to one another. The Sabbath is a great opportunity to do good. And this is a double benefit because if you're doing good with a family or with your church members, you're not just doing good, but you're also building fellowship time and family time. Jesus, in Mark chapter 10, verses 43 to 45, said, Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. So if service was good enough for Jesus, then it's certainly good enough for me. So keep in mind that the goal of your service is not just to be nice for the sake of being nice, but our goal is to draw others to Jesus Christ. And so let this be your driving factor as you choose your service opportunities. In Matthew chapter 25, we are told to look for the needs and fill them. So if someone is hungry, you feed them. If someone's sick and in prison, then you visit them. If they're a stranger, befriend them. Befriend the lonely and invite them to your home. Your opportunities are everywhere. And if you ask God to open your eyes to the needs around you, he will show you those needs and show you how to fill them. So back to our recipe, we talked about the first ingredient was Jesus, the second ingredient was, and the third ingredient is yourself. Can't forget yourself. Um, don't forget to take time to refresh yourself. The Sabbath was meant to be a day of rest, and while a nap here and a nap there um, won't offer much harm, I wonder if that was what God had really intended. How would you feel if an old friend came to visit you for a weekend and they spent the whole weekend sleeping instead of spending time with you? So I wonder if God's intent was more for us to be refreshed so that we can serve him better, so that our relationship with him and others would be improved. I once heard of an illustration that I'll share with you that hopefully might help shed some light on the Sabbath rest. So I have an iPhone. How many of you have smartphones? So you know that every now and then you'll get an alert on your phone that says you need to update it. It's time for your phone to get an update. During that time when it's updating, I can't use my phone. It's in what I'd like to compare it to as rest mode. To me, it seems like it's not doing anything. But it work is happening in the background. It's communicating with a big server somewhere, and it's getting updates so that it could be improved and function better. It's not turned off, 
but it's not doing the regular tasks that I like my phone to do. So I can't use it to make calls during that time. I can't send text messages. I can't surf the web. I can't do social media. So it's not doing those regular things, but it's not powered off. It's updating. And so I like to think about our Sabbath rest as an opportunity for us to update like the phone, where we rest from regular chores and the hassles of daily life so that we can upgrade. We're not powered off or sleeping, but instead we're in refresh or update mode so that we could be improved to function better. So, but of course, you know, what makes a special Sunday awesome is the toppings, you know, be it the caramel or the hot fudge, the nuts, the M&Ms, the cherry on top, or all of that. That's what really gives the Sunday the mmm, the bang. And so I thought we should add some toppings to our Sabbath delight. One of the toppings we can add is preparation. Planning to ahead to be ready with clothes prepped and your home tidied and your food prepared if necessary. Any activities that you're planning to do, plan those and make sure that you have the supplies on hand. If the Queen of England were coming to your home and the plan was for her to come to arrive at your home at 6 o'clock for dinner and she comes to your door and rings your doorbell right at 6 o'clock, how would you feel if when she came you weren't dressed Your clothes weren't ironed, the trash hadn't been taken out, and the food that she was coming to eat with you wasn't yet cooked. It'd be kind of embarrassing, wouldn't it? Yet how strange is it that we treat the arrival of God's Sabbath presence with less importance? But physical preparation isn't the only preparation that we need. Mental preparation is just as important. You see, anticipation is everything. When Andre and I went to Disney World a couple summers ago, We didn't just physically prepare by packing our suitcases, but for months we talked about what we were going to do, who we were going to see, where we were going to eat, when we were going to eat. We even looked at menus to figure out what we were going to order. We planned and talked about it and planned and talked about it. The planning was almost as much fun as being at Disney World itself. The Sabbath is the same thing. We should prepare our minds and our hearts to spend this special time with God. Traditions can also be a great topping to add on our Sabbath delight. Have you ever wondered what makes Christmas, Thanksgiving, or birthday so special? It's the traditional things like the birthday cake with the candles, or the special yummy Thanksgiving meal, or the twinkling Christmas lights, all those things that we look forward to every year. Those traditions help to add to the specialness. So come up with something special, a special tradition that you can look forward to every Sabbath. It could be something simple like lighting Sabbath candles or playing special Sabbath music as you get ready for Sabbath school or maybe eating on special Sabbath dishes. Think of something that works for your family, something your family would enjoy and look forward to and build it into your Sabbath lifestyle. But while traditions are great, you want to avoid the trap of falling into the same thing every day, every week, because even the most delightful thing can become dreary and seem like drudgery. And so you want to add a switcheroo here and there and change things up a bit. So don't try to do everything every Sabbath. So maybe one Sabbath you may do a nature hike, and another Sabbath you may visit the shut-in, and another Sabbath you may do potluck, and another Sabbath you may invite a family home. So be sure that while you have traditions, you want to add variety to your Sabbath. So in closing, let's go back to our story from the beginning. As you look at your invitation more closely, you realize that you were one of several of those invitees that the presidential family invited, and they were throwing a party in honor of their daughter's wedding. Interestingly enough, the responses to the invitation were quite varied. There were some people who didn't even care enough to RSVP. Others responded with excuses like they had to mow the lawn or go grocery shopping or study for a test. And still other guests were even obnoxious and assaulted the postman, throwing stones at the postman and his truck. Yikes. But some of the guests accepted the invitation graciously, and they turned up excited to celebrate with the family. And they enjoyed wonderful food. They were given new designer label clothing and some really awesome gifts. 
Today, you are given an invitation even better than this. How will you respond to the invitation to celebrate God's Day of Delight? Thank you.